On a warm September day in Berlin, Hungarian biochemist Katalin Kadiko walks into the nearly century-old auditorium at Berlin's Chetite Hospital. She takes her seat in the front row of a World Health Organization event. She's surrounded by politicians and public health leaders. Just a year earlier, there would have been little reason for Katalin to be there at all. Few of the other guests would have even known her name. But now, she's a guest of honor. Katalin spent her life researching messenger RNA, the tiny postal workers that carry genetic instructions inside cells. For decades, few paid attention to what she found. That has now changed. At the event in September, German Chancellor Angela Merkel praises Katalin for not giving up. The German Chancellor tells the audience that Katalin's 30 years of effort laid the groundwork for our current fight against COVID-19. In her own remarks, Katalin says her collaborators deserve credit too. First of all, I would like to correct you because there are many, many people contributed to it and I was just one of them and I am glad that I also could help. I am just representing all of those fellow scientists. Then she makes a plea for the dignitaries in the audience to give people with ideas that seem crazy a chance. Those who, who might have an idea which is too weird <laughs> to support, maybe they get more support and solve problems we will face in the future. Catalan doesn't stick around long for drinks afterward. She's at the coat check in less than an hour. She's going to Budapest. They're painting her picture onto the side of a building there. She's on the awards circuit, but she says she'd rather be back in her lab as soon as possible. Catalan helped lay the groundwork for our most important weapon against a deadly virus that has so far killed more than 5 million people around the globe. She never expected that. But she also showed the world the potential for a new technology, messenger RNA. And this is what Catalan had hoped for all along. This is a story about what most people would agree is the biggest success of the pandemic. Messenger RNA vaccines could never have proven themselves so quickly outside the crucible of that first pandemic year, 2020. The technology may well win some researchers a Nobel Prize. It will almost certainly have big implications for the future of medicine. Odds are you've taken one of these mRNA vaccines yourself. And you might think you know the story of how they swooped onto the world stage so quickly. But odds are you don't know the half of it. This is also the story of as unlikely a bunch of world-saving heroes as you'll ever encounter. My name is Naomi Kresge, and I'm a health journalist for Bloomberg News. In the first half of the season, you've heard about the lingering consequences of COVID for many patients and hospitals. Now, we'll tell you about the consequences for science. They're a lot more hopeful. From the Prognosis Podcast, this is Breakthrough. I first heard of messenger RNA vaccines in 2018, more than a year before the mysterious new virus emerged in Wuhan. The biggest buzz in the drug industry at that time was the idea of using the immune system to attack tumors and help cancer patients live longer. Scientists were trying a bunch of different ways to do this, and a source told me I should talk to the people at a German startup called BioNTech. Inside European biotech, everybody knew them. But outside that insular world, few people had ever heard of them. They were trying to make something that had failed many times before, a cancer vaccine. But they were trying to do it using messenger RNA. Here's BioNTech CEO Ugor Shahin speaking at a tech conference called Codex in 2019. I think you have to dare to start without having all solutions 
in, in, in the hand, hoping that something will come up that helps you. It was fascinating stuff, full of hope and cutting edge science. But as is often the case in the risky business of biotech, it wasn't at all clear that the mRNA vaccines would actually work. I wrote a feature story for the Newswire, then moved on to other topics and went on maternity leave. Then in January 2020, my boss called. He said a new story was keeping him busy, strange new coronavirus that had emerged in China and was spreading around the world. It's too bad you're not here now, he said. It'll probably be all over by the time you're back. Of course, when I came back to the office the next month, it wasn't over. It was spreading. I live in Germany. A few weeks later, we went into our first lockdown. And it's still not over. The world has changed. We're still finding out just how much. Our story starts in 1961. The modern study of human genetics was just getting going. Only eight years prior, scientists had discovered the double helix structure of DNA. Now, they were trying to figure out how cells act on the instructions encoded in the genes. A team from the Pasteur Institute in Paris identified an elusive molecule that copies pieces of genetic code and delivers its instructions into the machinery of the cell. They named it messenger RNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. Where DNA is a double strand, RNA is a single strand. There are a few types of RNA that play important roles in sending DNA's instructions to cells, and messenger RNA is essentially the errand boy. One of the best explanations I've heard of how the biology works comes from Derek Rossi, a Harvard University stem cell biologist. mRNA is actually a necessary and obligate intermediate between genes, which are encoded in DNA and live in the nucleus, and proteins, which do all the busy work of the cell, but they're made uh, in another part of the cell called the cytoplasm. So the two don't meet. DNA is in the nucleus, protein synthesis is in the cytoplasm. So there had to be an intermediate molecule, which was discovered to be messenger RNA, an appropriate, uh, an appropriate name. It carries the message uh, encoded by the gene out uh, to allow that sort of code to be turned into something that has utility, something that has function, proteins. So DNA makes mRNA, makes protein, makes all of life. Three French scientists shared a Nobel Prize in 1965 for the discovery of mRNA. But for decades after that, mRNA wasn't a very high-profile area for research. Part of the reason was that the molecule is fragile and hard to work with. Scientists didn't figure out how to synthesize it in the lab until 1984. In the 1990s, the field's superstars focused on DNA instead. DNA was easier than RNA to work with and more stable. It was also in the limelight, thanks to the mapping of the genome in the Human Genome Project. That lasted from 1990 to 2003. Scientists focused on the idea of curing illnesses by fixing errors in the genome. But there were a few exceptions. Researchers who stuck with mRNA despite the challenges, both scientific and personal. One of them came from Hungary. By the time the pandemic was a year old, her name would be known around the world as the woman who pioneered mRNA vaccines. She would be covered endlessly in newspaper articles and TV shows. But each time, I think I've learned everything about her story. Something new turns up to surprise me. Katalin Kariko was born in Hungary in 1955. She's in grade school when the first mRNA discoveries are being lauded. The Pasteur Institute and Nobel Prizes would have seemed very far away to her. She grows up under communism in Gishui Salash, a small town in the countryside of eastern Hungary. Her father is a butcher. 
but she knows, even as a teenager, that she wants to be a scientist. Catalan declined to be interviewed for this podcast. I and others at Bloomberg had already spoken to her many times, and she said she wants to focus again on her work after being on the interview circuit. I get where she's coming from. So we decided to draw from what I think is her most unusual interview. She spoke in May with Club Radio, an independent broadcaster based in Budapest. We've dubbed her voice from her native Hungarian. I'm not a special person at all. I saw that my parents work hard and I also try to help them, along with my sibling. We studied hard. That was our job. Catalan earned her PhD in Hungary at the University of Szeged, just a two-hour drive from where she grew up. She started her postdoctoral research in the same city, at the Biological Research Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. In 1978, as a PhD student in Hungary, she worked with RNA for the first time. It was the start of a lifelong obsession. In 1985, she got the opportunity to move to the U.S. for a job at Temple University in Philadelphia. She took it, moving with her husband and toddler daughter, the Hungarian government only allowed them to bring a hundred dollars with them legally. They sewed another nine hundred pounds, about one thousand two hundred dollars, into her daughter's teddy bear. We flew off. We didn't have any foreign relatives. We couldn't count on anyone to send us money. What she found wasn't what she had expected either. She says the lab wasn't as well equipped as the one back home, and one of the co-workers slammed doors and yelled. After a week, she wanted to leave. She stayed out of necessity and out of hope. We were in survival mode, and I thought I would learn something interesting and we would survive. And this is what changes people, that they become so defenseless and they must rely on their talent and make do with the best they can. By 1989, things were looking slightly better. Catalan got a research assistant professor position at the University of Pennsylvania. This was a chance to make a name for herself, maybe eventually get tenure. Because of the way these jobs work, she was expected to win her own grant funding to support her research. But she ran into a big roadblock. She was still obsessed with mRNA. What she had seen so far in her experiments convinced her that it would make a better medicine than DNA. But nobody else agreed. She wrote a lot of grant proposals. At one point, one every month, she told us. But nobody wanted to fund the experiments she wanted to do. Nobody wanted to fund work on mRNA. She didn't exactly make it easier on herself. One thing I learned from her Hungarian interview was that she wasn't a networker. Instead, she wanted to spend her time at the lab bench doing science. I always skip those meetings filled with small talk, which could have held my career. Those really drove me crazy. Even in stores, if there were long lines, I thought, you're stealing my time. Elliot Barnathan was her boss at the time. He's a cardiologist who was then an associate professor of medicine at Penn. Elliot was later to leave academia for a drug industry career. He's an executive at Johnson & Johnson now. But he remembers Catalan well. So the first thing is she's incredibly hardworking and, and brilliant. I mean, really, truly brilliant. And the thing that's interesting is that she's a voracious reader. And, and so she would always, you know, read science and nature and come into the lab this morning with the latest you know, issue of science that, you know, hadn't even come across my desk yet. And she had already read it and figured out somebody researching something completely different in a different continent or a different disease entity. But there was a kernel here that 
was going to help us do the next step of what we needed to do. And she was always connecting the dots. Messenger RNA degrades quickly in the body. There are enzymes that break loose mRNA down outside of cells. But it also goes away quite quickly once it's delivered its message inside the cell. Catalan thought that would actually be a good thing. She reasoned that you could use mRNA to flip a switch in the cell for a limited period of time. Elliot told me the idea would be for it to have the desired effect, then go away. But convincing the scientific establishment to give her experiments a chance proved very, very difficult. They could only see the challenge, not the potential benefit. For them, mRNA was too fragile, too fleeting. A dead end. So it was, very, it was very heretical back in those days. People said, oh, you're crazy. You know, mRNA will never work. Uh, it's too unstable. But she really firmly, you know, she had a vision that it was doable. It was just, we needed to figure out how to do it. Elliot used his own research funding to subsidize Catalan's experiments. They had some successes, but time and time again, she failed to get grant funding. In 1995, she was stripped of her assistant professor title and demoted to essentially a glorified lab researcher. It seemed unlikely that she would ever get her own lab. People just couldn't see the, see the truth of it, unfortunately. It was a bitter blow. After making it all the way from rural Hungary to Penn, one of the top research institutions in the world, Catalan faced the very real possibility that she might have to stop doing the work that she loved. At the same time, she was dealing with a cancer scare, and her husband was stuck back in Hungary for more than four months due to a processing delay for his green card. In the Hungarian radio show, she's interviewed alongside a singer named Zoran Stefanovic. The show has a unique format. It tries to put two people from totally different walks of life on the air together. In this case, Zoran wrote Catalan's favorite song, a ballad called Diamond and Gold. She chokes up when she talks about listening to him sing when things got tough. That has a Zoran released the song in 1985, the same year Catalan moved to the U.S., and was the frontman for two Hungarian rock bands in the 1960s and 1970s. Under a communist regime that opposed rock music, he knew a thing or two about persevering during tough times. Zoran's song is about how you need to work hard and stay the course to achieve your goals. Diamond and gold have a nice shine, he says, but you need to dig deep to get it. This resonates with Catalan. She digs a long time before she hits pay dirt. And even when she does, she's one of only a few who recognizes what she's found. The first time I interviewed Catalan was in summer 2020. Each time she speaks, I'm struck by how little bitterness she expresses about getting shut out by the academic establishment for so long. She sounds disappointed, yes, and sometimes frustrated. She also talks about how she rarely got a raise. She was hired at $40,000, and two decades later she was making $60,000, which she says is less than what a lab tech would make. But I got the impression that because she managed to keep on doing science, the lack of recognition and low pay, these were secondary concerns. Here she is earlier this year, speaking for a Bloomberg project about the one-year anniversary of the pandemic. This is previously on aired audio. As long as I was in the lab and focused what I can do, I was very happy. I mean, I was there at the weekends, long days, and my husband once said that, you know, Probably my earning is worse than in a uh, McDonald's because he calculated probably one dollar per hour. I <laughs> so as a biochemist in the 1990s, she was probably making less per hour than I did at the time, babysitting the kids on my street. In 1997, Elliot Barnathan, who was subsidizing Catalan's work at Penn, left the university to take a job at a biotech. 
She managed to find a spot in another lab, but she needed a close collaborator, someone enthusiastic about the science, with the clout to ensure she could fund her projects. How she found this person is one of those great water cooler moments that will probably go down in science textbooks. In early 1998, Catalin started seeing a new face at the Xerox machine, where she'd copy the academic journal articles that she read so eagerly. He was an immunologist named Drew Weissman, fresh off a fellowship at Tony Fauci's lab at the National Institutes of Health. Drew was also a voracious reader of journal articles. Back in those days, you'd have to hunt them up in the library or somebody else's lab, then copy them and take them home. They weren't online. Drew says they copied hundreds of articles. Before I ran into Katie Carrico over a Xerox machine, and we would both sort of fight over it, but really just wait for each other to finish. And we started talking. Drew was interested in dendritic cells, which help the immune system adapt to fight new intruders. They migrate throughout the body and collect foreign things. So that includes viruses, bacteria, parasites, uh, tumor cells, and they bring those to lymph nodes where they start immune reaction. And why that's important for a vaccine is that they're the critical cell that picks up a vaccine and turns on the immune reactions. Drew wanted to work on an HIV vaccine. Catalin thought mRNA could help. We started talking and I told her about my interest in dendritic cells and HIV. And she told me about her interest in mRNA. So we started working together and we started doing experiments together. And and that's where our collaboration started. It's important to note that up until then, Catalin wasn't really thinking about RNA as something you'd use to make a vaccine. She wanted to make treatments. To use mRNA to spur the cell's machinery to make a protein that the body needs to heal itself. In that sense, Weissman's involvement broadened her perspective. I should also note that some experiments at that point had already shown the promise of using genetic material to spur the body's cells to produce vaccine. In 1993, researchers at Merck and Co. were able to spur an immune response in mice by injecting them with DNA that contained instructions for influenza proteins. But seeing something work in animals and having it work in humans, those are two very different things. The the old line is mice lie and and macaques exaggerate. So if it happens in a mouse, that's never a guarantee it'll happen in a human. The body has multiple lines of defense against any mRNA that looks like it might not belong These guards are enzymes that will break down loose mRNA found outside a cell. If mRNA can duck those attacks and try to get inside a cell, its troubles aren't over. Derek Rossi, the Harvard stem cell scientist we heard from earlier, says the cell's first response is to do the exact opposite of what you'd want if you were going to use mRNA for a therapy. It's to stop making any proteins at all that doesn't want viral proteins being made in the cell. And then if the response is robust enough, it triggers these altruistic self-kill pathways uh, and they die because it's better for the cell to die than it is to serve as a manufacturing facility for 100,000 viral particles. Essentially, the cell flips a self-destruct switch. This makes a lot of sense from a biological standpoint. It ensures cells stay on track, make the right amount of the right protein, and don't get duped into producing a pathogen. But to use mRNA as a drug, Catalin and Drew had to figure out how to get it into the cell without flipping that self-destruct switch. That was a lot of years of research. It was about seven years of work together. And what we did is we first had to figure out why it was inflammatory. So what receptors was it activating? How was it being recognized? 
So we, we found some receptors. Other people found receptors. In total, there are 17 of them. And we started to look at how RNA interacted with those receptors. They did years of painstaking experiments trying to disable the self-destruct switch. Finally, the breakthrough came in an unexpected place. You could say luck played a role. Luck made possible by years of hard work. Catalan's old boss, Elliot Barnathan, explained it to me. She's a brilliant scientist, and, you know, sometimes it's the controls that you use that really help you to make the advances, not necessarily what the experiment is, but how well controlled it was. The control group is the part of the experiment where you usually don't change anything. The part that's supposed to serve as a comparison to show whether the hypothesis you're testing is true. Catalan was using a special type of RNA called transfer RNA as a control in one of her experiments. This tRNA has an important difference compared to mRNA. There's a different arrangement of a structural piece called uridine. So Catalan uses this tRNA in the control group, and she notices something unusual. The immune response, inflammation, didn't happen in those cells. That was sort of the light bulb that went off in her head. She decides to make a slight modification to the RNA molecule to mimic what naturally occurs in transfer RNA. Bingo. The cells don't try to fight off the foreign RNA. And even better, they make 10 times as much protein. And so it was a double whammy. And, and that was really the fundamental patent that both Moderna and the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccines use in terms of mRNA therapy. In 2005, Catalan Carrico and Drew Wiseman published a paper laying out their method for modifying RNA. I asked Drew what he thought would happen next. So that was one of my more embarrassing moments because what I, what I said to Katie after the paper was published was that our phones are going to start ringing off the hook and people are going to call us up and want to work with RNA and drug companies are going to want to use RNA and our phones never rang. We, we would sit there looking at the phone and nothing happened. And days and weeks and months and years went by and nothing happened. Nobody was interested, even though we published how to make it work well and how to use it as a drug. Nobody was interested. I find that astonishing. I asked him why he thought that was. You know, I think that even though we published that paper, they still said RNA is too difficult to work with. And they just didn't want to work with RNA. Catalan said she felt like Cassandra, the mythological Trojan priestess who finds that her gift of prophecy is really a curse. I mean, I knew that... It can be used for everything. And, you know, kind of a Cassandra feeling that I can see the future and nobody believes me. Catalan and Drew file for a patent. They keep on doing experiments. But it would take someone with more salesman skills to bring the technology to the limelight. Derek Rossi, who we heard from earlier, had been a postdoctorate fellow at Stanford University when Drew and Catalan published their study. He didn't read it at the time. But a few years later, at Harvard, he ran into it while trying to solve a problem in stem cell biology. He wanted to convert cells back into a state similar to that of an embryonic stem cell, a state from which a cell can turn into any type of cell in the body. A Japanese researcher named Shinya Yamanaka had shown this was possible. But he had used a virus to deliver the genetic cargo to reprogram the cells, which scarred the cell. Derek wanted to use mRNA instead. He decided to try a test protein first, something that would be easy to recognize if it worked. We encoded for the gene for the green fluorescent protein, which is a jellyfish gene that uh, fluoresces green under a certain wavelength of light. 
uh, and we synthesize that mRNA and then we put it onto cells, human cells in a dish. And we got a few green cells, but we got a lot of dead cells. And dead cells, of course, was not our, our goal. We were not trying to make a plate full of dead cells. Nope, they wanted green cells. Or rather, they wanted to get the cells to express this green fluorescent protein. So we realized we had a, another challenge. Why? What was killing all these cells uh, when we introduced the mRNA? They almost gave up. But then Derek turned to academic journals to see if anybody else had run into this issue. And that is where we came across the work of uh, Kathleen Carrico and Drew Weissman, whom in 2005 published a, a, a seminal paper, which, by the way, got largely ignored by the academic press. Derek's team followed the instructions in the paper, swapping the modified building blocks for the RNA. And now when we put that jellyfish mRNA onto cells, essentially all the cells in the dish were happy and blasting expression of this GFP protein. So we were no longer killing cells en masse uh, in the dish. And that that discovery that they made, I believe, is, well, it's fundamental to this entire field. Uh, and I believe it's going to earn them a Nobel Prize because it really is what allows these mRNA vaccines and any mRNA uh, therapeutic down the road. It's the enabling sort of piece to the puzzle. Derek's team published a paper in 2010 showing that they could use mRNA to reprogram human skin cells. Now this was sexy enough to get people's attention. It made a huge splash. You may have seen the headlines. Scientists can now take an ordinary cell from the body and transform it into a cell that's very similar to an embryonic stem cell. Most of the media reports were about the stem cells, not the mRNA technology. And that was exciting indeed from a basic science perspective. But Derek was already thinking about the broader potential. And I was thinking to myself, OK, uh, there's a lot of attention being given to the cell based aspect of this, but nobody's really sort of recognizing the modified mRNA based aspect. So I should go out and try to start a company around this. And that's that's the origin of Moderna. And I went out and uh, convinced uh, some early investors and people that this had potential. And it sort of launch, launches the industry, I guess. A Harvard colleague introduced Derek to venture capital company flagship Pioneering, which founded Moderna in 2010. Operations began the next year. Industry veterans signed on, including Stefan Bancel, an experienced French executive who took the CEO's job at Moderna. The company stayed private for eight years, raising $2.5 billion in venture capital and drug company investment along the way, then had one of the biggest IPOs in biotech history in December 2018. Along the way, Moderna earned a reputation for secrecy. Until 2017, it published few scientific papers, preferring to keep its discoveries under wraps. Derek left the company he founded in 2014 to focus on his research. Catalin still reflects with wonder on how Bancel and Moderna were able to collect so much money when she wasn't even able to get a research grant. I concluded probably I did not explain well, because look, come a, come a salesman, the, like Stefan Bansa for Moderna, and, and he goes to have a breakfast with the Soriot, and then in 10 minutes already, $240 million, he could convince him that that mRNA is good for everything. And uh, I, I said the same to people, and they didn't even give me $10,000 <laughs> for the research. But in Germany, a very different competitor was also working on the mRNA technology. Husband-wife team Ugor Shahin and Özlem Juretschi founded BioNTech in 2008, before Derek Rossi's work brought the idea of modified mRNA into the limelight. The pair had spent years pursuing immune-based treatments for cancer, starting in the 1990s at the University Medical Center of the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz. 
Ugwer had started exploring mRNA as a delivery method in 2000, something his wife once told me was considered a crazy idea at the time. Where Moderna was polished and corporate from the start, BioNTech had an academic vibe. Ugur uses his university email address. They've published hundreds of scientific papers. In 2014, Ugur hired Catalin Carico away from Penn. They put out a press release saying that her work had opened a new field of therapy. She finally got her own lab, just down the hall from the CEO's office. Catalin says she joined because she wanted to see her work in action. I wanted to see the first patient to be treated. Some One person, at least, I wanted to see that, okay, this modified mRNA had one, one person, at least. How the story would go from there? Well, she never expected that. That's next time on Breakthrough. Next week on Breakthrough, we'll tell you about the frantic 10 months of COVID-19 vaccine development that silenced the doubters, in the scientific community at least. It was um, highly likely that this is going to be a pandemic, and we started to discuss what we can do. This episode of Prognosis Breakthrough was written and reported by me, Naomi Kresge. Topher Forges is our senior producer. Carl Kevin Robinson Jr. is our associate producer. Our theme music was composed and performed by Hannes Brown. Veronica Guyash did voiceover. And Emma Court, Bob Langrith, and Sultan Shimon contributed reporting. Rick Schein is our editor. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like this episode, please leave us a review. It helps others find out about the show. Thanks for listening.